Good morning or whatever time it is when you're watching this. I'm Pastor Ken Larson, pastor of uh, one of the pastors of Trinity Lutheran Church in Delray Beach, Florida. And this is our regular Sunday morning Bible study. We record it on Saturday. We broadcast it live uh, on Sundays at 10 o'clock. And then you can watch it any time after that on uh, YouTube. So we're glad that you are here, whoever you are and wherever you are. We are together. And uh, let us uh, pray. Lord God, you have gathered us for your own purposes. You have laid your word before us. And the Holy Spirit is with us and in us according to your great promise. And so we thank you for that word. Make it clear to our minds and to our hearts. And let us find application to the lives that you have given us to live in this wide world of yours. Cause us not be, to be afraid of pestilence or plague, but to put our trust in you as we ask you for deliverance and as we ask you for healing for our nation, for those who are sick, and for ourselves as we seek to be helpers in this world that you have given us to superintend for the time being. Lord God, you have also given us a Savior, Jesus Christ, and we pray this in his name. Amen. 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 Well, the expectations that we have been studying, and uh, they are the expectations that God has laid upon his people in the Old Testament, and then the application for what expectations God has laid upon us. The Lord's expectations for a man who begins life at the age of three years old in the temple, that is in the tabernacle, I'm sorry, in the tabernacle, and he becomes a prophet. And Samuel has the job as prophet to tell what you have been told. That is a simple definition of prophet. Tell what you've been told. We are going to interrupt our study of Samuel to talk about the Lord's expectations for those who interpret the Lord's word today. We promised that study last week you remember. And then the Lord's expectations for Israel under a king, which is a new chapter in the life of Israel. All right, are you ready to begin? Yes. We welcome Judy and Jeannie and Evelyn and those who are joining us uh, by recorded events. As we begin our study, we remember the hymn that was suggested by 1 Samuel chapter 3, Speak, O Lord, your servant is listening. That's what Samuel said to the Lord when he appeared that night. Speak, O Lord, your servant listens. Let your word to me come near. And that's our prayer, to ask God to give us newborn life and spirit and let the promises of God still our fears. And as we begin our study, there are three things that I want to emphasize. The first is listen. God is speaking now in his word. Now is the word. And discern what God intended to say then. When that part of the scripture was written, what was God saying to the readers and the listeners then. I remember a professor saying, how in the world are you going to tell people what God means now if you don't know what he was saying, intended to say then? That's kind of stuck in my mind as an indelible uh, uh, touchstone. What did God intend to say to those people back then? And then ask what God would have us know and believe and follow now. So we have a now, a then, and then a now again. To listen, discern, and ask as we read or hear the Bible read to us, as it happens in worship 
and as the Bible is interpreted for us. I got that? Listen, discern, mm -hmm. and ask. And God the Holy Spirit will answer that prayer. All right? Any comments on this? No. Okay. The Lord's expectations. I want you to recall what God has already done. First Samuel chapters 1, 2, and 3. He raised Samuel under Eli. Eli cared for him and taught him. And then he warned Israel, that is, Samuel warned Israel about the consequences of sin. The Lord also warned through an unnamed prophet about the consequences of his sin and the sin of his two uh, children. He initiated Samuel as a prophet by appearing to him and then revealing his judgment against Eli. Remember that? I hit the cough button. All right, and now our uh, interruption. Huh? I want you to look at this. It, I introduced last week briefly, and I said we would go over it in detail today. It's very important. We probably have talked about this in Bible class before. The difference between reading something into the text versus reading something out of the text, from the text. You remember the two words, eisegesis and exegesis. Eis, the beginning syllable is like the I in ice. Got it? Eisegesis. And the other word is exegesis. And the G-E-S-I-S has nothing to do with the name of our Savior, all right? It's not from that. It's from a word which means to go or to come. So that's the first. The first one is reading into, right? Right. Now, here we have them side by side, one at a time. The difference between reading into versus reading out of. Eisegesis means to lead into. To lead into. The dictionary says that eisegesis is a subjective method of interpretation by introducing one's own presuppositions, agendas, biases, or opinions into the original. All right? It's the opposite of exegesis. Eisegesis can be defined as an interpretation especially of scripture, that reflects the personal ideas or viewpoint of the interpreter. So that's a lot of commentaries. You have to be very careful about the commentaries one uses. Test a commentary against what the word itself says and other parts of scripture that you know pertain to the same idea or subject or person. So if the interpretation comes from the interpreter, we're in trouble. Now, if the person interpreting says, I think, but I don't know from scripture, the word think gives you the signal that you are not getting an interpretation, but an opinion. And that would be reading something into a text that isn't there. Maybe I should say, isn't necessarily there. It may be but it's not a direct a result of studying the text. And again, you compare it with its opposite eisegesis, exegesis. Eisegesis is the personal interpretation of a text, especially the Bible, is in your own ideas. I think the third one is redundant, the third definition. All right, and now we, again, we've lost our there we go. The difference between reading into versus reading out, to, out of. Uh, I'm going to ask Jeannie to read 2 Timothy 3 or 2.15. The print is too small for me to read. I'm sorry. Oh, you're on the phone. Okay. Uh -huh. Judy, you're our professional okay. reader today. Do your best to present yourself to God as one approved, a worker who has no need to be ashamed, rightly handling the word of truth. 
to interpret that Bible verse, we have to do a little work, and we're not going to do it all now this morning. But one of the big things that you hear me talking about all the time when I teach is what is the context? The context is it's Paul writing to a young pastor named Timothy. Okay, that's all I'm going to say about the context right now. The word approved here is the same word that is used in the Bible when you're testing whether a coin is a valid coin or a counterfeit. And there are many ways of doing that. So do yourself, uh, present yourselves as one approved, one who has been accepted after having been tested. A coin would be accepted as genuine after it had been tested, as one can test the metal to see whether it's truly a gold coin, for example. And so a worker named Timothy would present himself not to the people, but to God as one who is approved after having been tested. Now that's the first part. The second part is rightly handling has to do with the ortho and to meo. You don't have to know the Greek, but you know that ortho is the name of a company that produces various chemicals for gardening and farming. And they call themselves ortho because this is how to use the right chemical on the right crop at the right time, ortho, right? So when you buy ortho products, it's the right one. <laughs> That's what they want you to think, all right? You have the word ortho in the word orthodox, which means right teaching. But here we have ortho plus tomeo, tomeo, and tomeo is a Greek word which means cut. So you make a compound word, ortho, tomeo, rightly handling is a translation of one Greek word, ortho, tomeo. And so together, the compound means cut straight or hold to a straight course or handle right or as it's translated in many translations, rightly dividing the word of truth. Uh, you got that idea? Okay. Approve and cut. You know, cut the scriptures with the scissors. No, no. But you, you study it to get the right meaning out of it the one that God intended. That's what reading means when Timothy is instructed in the word. So I'll put the verse back up again because I want to say some more about it. One who rightly handles the word of God, which has been God-breathed, inspired, that can, that's in 2 Timothy 2, uh, 3.16, rightly handles the word of God, has the goal of saying only what God the Holy Spirit intended when he inspired that portion of the word. Paul wrote it. The inspiration of the Holy Spirit guided him and told him what to say. And the Holy Spirit intended a meaning here. There's a meaning in that sentence. In every language, a sentence carries a meaning and has one or more applications. So that's what we have as rightly dividing the word of truth. And that's the difference. Any questions or comments about this idea of reading something into scripture versus bringing something out of scripture? Very important. No, oh, it's just it's just that it's really easy to do, and especially in today's climate, I think it's real easy to do. It is. And how can you guard against it? Well, you have to continually stay in a Bible and in study of the Bible. You have to continue to pray for discernment as you read the Bible. I think that's one of the big things is to be able to discern. 
And uh, by staying in a Bible study with other um, believers, they can help you to, uh, just like you can help keep us on the right path if we kind of stray off the path with our reasoning or interpretation. So, and vice versa. Yes. You, you test the teachers as well as the people. You test everyone against the scriptures. They are our only norm and guide and rule in interpreting all of doctrine and judging all doctrine. So I'm going to put it back up on the screen just one more time for your memory's sake. What is eisegesis? It's, eisegesis. Oh, re reading into, reading into uh, the Bible verse. Uh, putting your putting your thoughts into it. That's the answer that comes up on the screen. And then exegesis is what? Uh, reading out, uh, reading out of the Bible verse. What it actually says. Yeah. There is an objective truth there that exists whether you are there or not. You come to it to read what God says out of Scripture. All right. Enough of that intentional tangent, which would help us in all of our Bible studies, whether you do it personally, during your time of devotion or curiosity, as you read 1 Samuel after this lesson is over, and I hope you will, as I have been reading. Um, it's very interesting. It gets very complicated, but it, it's something that you can follow. Even if you can't pronounce all the Bible names, which are many, all right, now back to our story, 1 Samuel chapter 3 and 4, Samuel becomes a prophet. You know that God establishes Samuel as a prophet. Judy, uh, clear voice, uh, okay. read what you can. <clears throat> uh, 1 Samuel chapter 3, verses 19 to 21, starting with verse 19. And Samuel grew... And the Lord was with him, and let none of his words fall to the ground. And all Israel, from Dan to Beersheba, knew that Samuel was established as a prophet of the Lord. And the Lord appeared again at Shiloh, for the Lord revealed himself to Samuel at Shiloh by the word of the Lord. And the word of Samuel came to all Israel. You see what I've underlined there? Mm -hmm. The word of the Lord and the word of Samuel. And there's an equation there. There's an equation. The prophet tells what God has revealed to him. You tell what you've been told. God establishes Samuel as a prophet. Samuel does not call himself to this office. It cannot be. All the callings come from God. Samuel grew, and the Lord was with him, and let none of his words fall to the ground. And all Israel, from Dan to Beersheba, knew that Samuel was established as a prophet of the Lord. You see the establishment here. He is established in particular in this way. As a prophet, none of his words fall to the ground. Now, what does that mean? I would think, think that uh, I would think that all of the words that he spoke um, fell on the ears of um, the Israelites or or anyone around him. It wasn't allowed to um, go in vain. The word of the Lord is never in vain. That's correct. And if a prophet tells what's going to happen, and it happens. That is a fulfillment, and it proves that his prophecy was true. That's how you judge a prophet. If it's true according to the word of the Lord, then it happens. None of his words were empty or useless. Now, when he was talking about what he had to eat, um, that is not part of the prophet's words. Do you understand when he is speaking as a prophet, none of his words fall to the ground. Secondly, 
Have you ever heard this expression? All Israel from Dan to Beersheba. You ever wonder what that meant? Well, it covers it covers a good part of uh, the land of Israel. Those were the different, uh, I don't know if they called them provinces or what, uh, of, of Israel. Uh, those are cities. Are cities. Uh, yeah, Dan is a city. And so is Beersheba. And here we have a map which illustrates it better than I can do with words. Okay, from the north to the south. That's right. Dan to Beersheba is about the distance from Delray Beach to the Space Coast. About 150 miles. You see how small Israel is compared to the United States? Well, when I was on my trip over there last year, it was amazing because I thought Bethlehem was so far away from Jerusalem. And it was like the suburb. It was like going from Boynton to Del Rey. Yeah. And we were suddenly in Bethlehem. And an hour outside of Jerusalem, we were, uh, you know, practically up to Nazareth. Yes. I... I recall the comparison that I heard many, many years ago that Israel is about the size of the state of, uh, no, just, it just dropped out. The state below New York and New Jersey. Oh, New Jersey, yeah. It's not very big. Square miles, yes. Yeah, okay. So all of the tribes of Israel settled between these two north-south markers. Dan, Beersheba in the south. He put the people of Israel in a rather small territory. Mm -hmm. So the phrase from Dan to Beersheba can be found in the Old Testament about 12 times. Okay. They knew what it meant and we have to interpret it. All this Israel from Dan to Beersheba knew, they knew it, that Samuel was established as a prophet of the Lord. Established here is the same idea that we had in 2 Timothy 2.15. Established in the Old Testament meant found faithful and approved. And you know that Samuel had God's approval. He picked him out, he prepared him, and then he installed him. Although his installation as a prophet was not a ceremony, but a vision that came in the night. That's pretty direct, isn't it? Mm -hmm. And he's established as a prophet of the Lord. All right. Here's the verse again. The Lord appeared by the word of the Lord, and the word of the Lord came to all Israel. It happened at Shiloh. Why Shiloh? Hmm. I don't know. That's where the tabernacle was. Okay. And whether it was in the tabernacle or not, we aren't told. But it was direct. The Lord appeared. We don't know how long the appearance was or the content. But the Lord appeared and gave him what to say. The word of Samuel then is the word of the Lord when he speaks as a prophet. And all Israel knew. So there was a, a reception of, of Samuel. And he is um, the first prophet since Moses, or if you want to count um, others that follow Moses as, as minor prophets, you could. But they maybe are never given that title. Samuel was to pass on God's word to Israel so that they might know the Lord and his will for them. God is a communicating God. He does not hide, as I've often said, behind a curtain and have us guess what he's like. Think of how many false religions have arisen in the world because people began to think in their own minds mm -hmm. and create God in their own image. That's where false religions begin, in the mind of man. And it's even worse than eisegesis because they are reading into their own minds the creation of a false god. And they will always be wrong. Because the true god 
is the God who says, I am who I am. And I am going to tell you about myself. The word of the Lord came to all Israel. And what was that word? A very simple way of saying that the word of God is God's self-revelation. I'm going to tell you about myself. I'm going to tell you about you. And I'm going to tell you about the connection that I have established between me and you. That's the Bible in one sentence. God's self-revelation of himself, including all of his attributes. You can name dozens of them. And his will. What does God want? If you don't know what God wants, open the Bible and read it. God's word of his, is his self-revelation of his plan for Samuel and for Israel, and by extension for all people, although there are particulars in the Old Testament which don't apply to us today. We aren't going out to kill the Philistines. I don't know if you could find any. God reveals his steadfast love and his forgiveness and his providence. I created you. I love you. I know you have sinned. I give you my forgiveness because of Jesus. And I'm going to provide for you. Don't you worry about things. I've got it covered. That's a wonderful thing about God. I've got it covered. I know I'm stealing uh, Channel 29's <laughs> trademark. We've got you covered. God reaches out to people. I am your God. Isn't that wonderful? We have a God who claims us as his own and surrounds us with everlasting love. And that's not going away. Samuel begins to lead God's people. Now here is a brief summary of the next several chapters. The ark gets capture, captured by the Philistines. Some people say Philistines. My Bible has an accent mark after the S. So I've been corrected. Philistines. The ark, be, uh, well, they have trouble with it. <laughs> it causes tumors. And it, and it makes their God fall over. And then the ark is returned in chapter 7 because the Philistines just can't deal with this. The power of God. Samuel anoints Saul as king. Chapter 8 through 10. A chapter we're going to look at in more detail. Samuel leads the people to Gilgal and warns the people. And I'm going to take up chapter 12 uh, further if we get there. Samuel says to Paul, uh, Saul, the Lord has torn the kingdom from you. Saul reigns for 40 years and, and he is so unfaithful that uh, he gets this sentence that he will no longer be king. Chapter 15. Chapter 16, Samuel anoints David as king. A man after my own heart. Wow. And if we go all the way to chapter 25, uh, that's the end of his <coughs> He goes to be with the Lord. So if you read this, in the next several weeks, you'll see the idea. <clears throat> Let's look at chapter 12 in more detail. As Samuel leads and warns as judge and prophet. Samuel is never a king. He's not a king. He doesn't become a king. As far as I know from the Bible, he never wants to be a king. In fact, having the word of the Lord, I know that God's will was not originally to give them a king. And yet, Samuel possesses the power and authority given him by God to lead and govern and judge. Sounds like a king, but he's not. God is ruling through him. It's a theocracy. Many people today are afraid of theocracies because they are not part, they don't 
agree with a theo. <laughs> they think that the theocracy that we're talking about in the world today is ruled by a God who is not the true God. You understand? That's the trouble we have today is anyone who says we're a theocracy, we'd have to judge what God is the one who you say is leading you. Samuel has his leading from the books of Moses as his guide. And you remember he spent years under Eli's tutelage. So he knows something and he believes. He also has direct revelation from God to serve as God's spokesman. The word of the Lord comes to him and he tells what he has been told. Direct revelation. Now Samuel is outfitted for both offices, both judge and prophet. And if we look into chapter 12, we can see both op offices operating. Samuel began to tell the righteous deeds of the Lord. The Lord has been your king all along. And this is the issue that divides the people from God. Samuel is telling the people, your God defeated the Egyptians. He led your fathers to dwell in this place. And he defeated the Philistines. He brings up the most recent example of God doing what God does all by himself. The Israelites did not, did not defeat the Philistines. They were afraid of them. How many times this has happened? Here's a quote from 1 Samuel 12. Samuel says to the people, You said, No, but a king shall reign over us. When the Lord your God was your king. Now behold the king, Saul, whom you have chosen, for whom you have asked. Behold, the Lord has set a king over you. You have a, a mystery here. You have God's will. You're not to have a king. I am your king. You have the people clamoring for a king. And you look at the character of God. How even though he is against having a king, he allows them to have a king. But wait, he first, he first tells them, if you're going to have a king, I'm going to tell you what it's going to cost you. <laughs> oh, you can read it in detail, but I'm not bringing that up today unless I get time. Samuel warns the people. He continues to preach, preach to God's people. Uh, Judy, give my voice a rest, would you? Okay, 1 Samuel chapter 12, verses 14 and 15. If you will fear the Lord and serve him and obey his voice and not rebel against the commandment of the Lord, and if both you and the king who reign over you will follow the Lord your God, it will be well. But if you will not obey the voice of the Lord, but rebel against the commandment of the Lord, then the hand of the Lord will be against you and your king. How about that? You see the uh, consequences? Mm -hmm. The consequences, if you will not obey the voice of the Lord, then, see, even though you're going to live under a king, you're still under me. I am your God, and I have a will. And if you won't obey my voice, then... I will not be with you. My hand will be against you. Hmm. So Samuel gives the people a sign. Again, Judy, what's the sign? Okay, Samuel gives the people the sign. Now, therefore, stand still and see this great thing that the Lord will do before your eyes. Is it not wheat harvest today? I will call upon the Lord that he may send thunder and rain. And you shall know and see that your wickedness is great, which you have done in the sight of the Lord, in asking for yourselves a king. So Samuel called upon the Lord, and the Lord sent thunder and rain that day. And all the people greatly feared the Lord and Samuel. 
<laughs> now, we have to know something about the weather in Israel at this time of the year. So we'd have to know that this wheat harvest is going to take place in June. And we'd have to know, that's why I put the asterisk here, because I put a footnote in here. It was June and the rain normally did not fall in June. So this is the sign. This is the sign because he says, it's, it's wheat harvest today, right? And you're not expecting rain, right? Well, I'm gonna call upon the Lord to send thunder and rain. And guess what happened? It's it rained. Rain. <laughs> not and good people, for harvest. And the people said, oh, the Lord really is with Samuel. And this is reestablishing Samuel's office in the hearts of and minds of the people that he really is a prophet. And that this really is God that's talking to us. So Samuel warns the people, and we're talking about law and gospel here, and I'm going to read these in paragraph form, because the first paragraph, and I've separated it into four paragraphs, is like confession of sins, because it says, all the people said to Samuel, pray for your servants to the Lord your God, that we may not die, for we have added to all our sins this evil, to ask for ourselves a king. We have sinned against you by thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. Does it sound familiar? Mm -hmm. We have sinned in asking for a king. Well, they realized it, but now they're stuck with a king. The absolution comes in a very obscure way. Samuel said to the people, do not be afraid. They were afraid that the Lord could wipe them out for their sin. So he says, do not be afraid. God is talking to the people through Samuel. You have done all this evil in this tiny word yet. Can you hear that? The, the parent is talking to the child. You have done evil. And I see that you have confessed it. Don't be afraid. You've done this. And yet, you hear that? Yeah. Very subtle absolution. Maybe it's too weak to call it an absolution. And yet... Yet do not turn aside from following the Lord. That's God's appeal to them. But serve the Lord with all your heart. That's a big phrase for you and I to consider. To serve the Lord with all your heart. And do not turn aside after empty things that cannot profit or deliver. For they are empty. They are empty. Well, there are many things that are empty. And the first thing is a false god. And the second thing is the things that we collect. I've been reading Ecclesiastes. I've been reading a, a book interpreting Ecclesiastes. Everything is empty. But the promise comes from God, for the Lord will not forsake his people, for his great name's sake, because it has pleased the Lord to make you a people for himself. I will instruct you in the good and right way. That's a promise. I'm not going to leave you, even though you've been evil. For my name's sake, because it pleases me to make you a people for myself. And that's what I've done. So I'm going to continue through my prophets and apostles and teachers I'm going to instruct you in the good and right way. And we know this happened because we have the rest of the Bible. And the application to us, and especially to the people of that day, and it's the imperative voice, it's law, 
It's the third use of the law as our guide. Only fear the Lord and serve him faithfully with all your heart. There's that phrase again, with all your heart. But consider what great things he has done for you. Now there is the gospel motivation. When we consider what great things God has done for us, we are moved by that love of his demonstrated to us to want to serve him faithfully with all our heart. The law itself has no power to move us, but only to make us afraid. Don't be afraid, but fear the Lord and serve him faithfully with all your heart. Consider. And stop for a moment and think about that. You've lived uh, many decades, right? Some of you. Some only a few decades. But consider in your life what God has done for you. And consider what he did for you in the first century A.D. in putting his son on the cross for you and giving you all that you need for this body and this life and for the life to come which he has promised to you. Consider all that the Lord has done what great things God has done for me from that hymn. And the story continues. We're not going to be going further into 1 Samuel here in this Bible study. But with this introduction, I'm simply inviting you to keep on reading and see how the Lord uses Samuel for his high and holy purposes as prophet and judge and as a leader in Israel. God has a purpose in doing this. These chapters narrate how the Lord used Samuel to establish his word <clears throat> as Israel faces his enemies from both the inside and the outside of the nation. Then Samuel is going to continue to tell the people that God demands obedience, offers hope to the repentant, but wrath against the disobedient. It's a simple, simple formula. And it's all over the scriptures. Obey me. And when you sin, come to me with repentant hearts. I will give you hope and forgiveness. But I reserve my wrath against those who will not repent. You see the three there? Mm -hmm. Obey. I have forgiven you. But don't you go again and do that again. Remember the face of your parent, whichever one it was, when he or she said, I don't want to see you doing that again. That voice was powerful, unless you didn't care and you went away. The people of Israel have demanded a king and Samuel has anointed Saul as the first king of Israel. So consider what great things God has done for you and apply what we have been talking about in these Bible lessons. I think this is number seven. In applying this Bible study to our lives, we will search our consciences according to the word of the Lord that has come to us in the Bible. The Lord our God is our king. Doesn't matter what kind of nation, government you have, or none, the Lord is your king. And he rules through people, through fallible, sinful people. You can study that as another topic in the Bible. Confess our sins, that's what we will do, including depending on other gods to save us. God does not countenance other gods. He is a jealous God, and he has a right to be jealous. And we should believe the absolution. When God says to, to us, I have forgiven you, I do forgive you. And when he does it, he does it through the shed blood, because without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sins. None. None. Without the shedding of Jesus' blood, the only blood that covers the mercy seat. 
And we should be confident that he will lead and guide us through his word, the word of the Lord from Genesis to Revelation. As we read, Mark learned and inwardly digest his word. Okay. Next week, a new topic. On my desk, I have a dozen ideas. <laughs> and maybe this week I'll come up with another half dozen. I don't know which I will choose. I'll talk to you separately or invite your text or your email if you have an idea. Yeah, throw it out in an email and see what uh, folks think about it, the topics. I might, I might do that and I might find that to be, uh, well, we did that once. So I can't say what it'll be. Stay tuned. That's a good word. That's a good word. Or, or the rest of the story, huh? <laughs> yes. So we ask you to join us on Zoom on Saturday. If uh, you're watching this and you're not getting my email about how to get into our Zoom room, it's by invitation for security reasons. But if you want to get into it, uh, email me and uh, I can... Uh, I can send you that log on information. Okay. Every Sunday we have worship in our sanctuary at 8.30 and 10.30 with social distancing and temperature checking and masking all the things that we should do for our own care and for the care of others. And if that is not good for you, for your reasons, then watch online at trinitydelray.org and tune in the broadcast at 8.30 and 10.30. Okay. Thank you for joining us. It's good to have you. The Lord be with you until we meet again. <laughs>